Let's go. Let's give it up for the band leading us in worship. Man, if I speak Jesus doesn't do it for you, something's wrong. Something's wrong, man. Uh, I hope that you already are in the spirits, and uh, we're going to continue that. We've been starting a series to, to start the year off right, uh, Chance to Change. And uh, today we're going to actually talk about the chance to change uh, what you're chasing. And so uh, we're going to ask that question, what are you chasing, in, in just a moment. But before we do, uh, we always want to acknowledge uh, milestone life change opportunities. And um, whenever people give and serve, and then that leads to amazing things happening in people's lives, especially when it's focused on the next generation. And, and last weekend, we did our FUSE Winter Conference for all of our students. And I'd like to just take a moment to honor not only just our student pastors, but all those that volunteered to make that life change possible. Can we give a moment and honor those? If you weren't here last weekend, um, there was a highlight reel um, on uh, Saturday night. They concluded at the new building on 3330 El Dorado. And uh, my sons were like, you know, hey, Dad, I guess we, uh, we led the first worship service at the new building. And I was like, well, technically it wasn't a Sunday, so it doesn't count. But anyway, <laughs> uh, but I saw the video and I heard the stories and there was a lot of emotion in there. And I just thought, what a vision, right? That for the next, you know, how many ever years, several decades, uh, that building is gonna host so much life change. And that's what we celebrate here at Genesis Metro Church. And so I'm um, looking forward to, to that. Um, and so turn our minds to today's topic. And I wanted to just ask you, what are you chasing? What are you chasing? And I think that uh, there's oftentimes some dissonance between what we say and what we are actually doing. Would, every, would everybody agree with that? Have you ever seen that? Like if you made any resolutions, you probably said those, and now maybe you're already struggling in February, right? Um, so, so think about that for a moment. In the Christian space, you would say, I hope you would say that you know, what are you chasing after? I hope you would say Jesus, right? I want to chase after Jesus. Wherever Jesus is going, whatever he wants me to do, that's what I want for my life. And so we would all agree that as a staple, if you're a believer in Christ and he's saved your soul, that's, that's a natural position to take. And then you would have to ask yourself, like, oh, okay, if I were to measure, though, and so this is always good, like, if you want to do good introspection and you want to grow internally, you have to ask yourself, okay, by what measure, okay, what what verifiable thing could I, could I show that would say that I am indeed chasing after Jesus? Because it's one thing to want to chase after Jesus. It's another thing to actually do the chasing after Jesus. And so how you prioritize your time and the things that you involve yourself with and his word or worship or church or life groups or whatever it is that you're doing, that would signify how it is exactly you're going to chase after Jesus. So we move it from theory to application. And so as we start this first part of the message, it's really going to have two halves. I'm going to set up a principle in the beginning of, of kind of the, the right way of thinking. And then we're going to see how Joshua applied that thinking as they crossed over to the other side. And so if there's an area of your life that you've had a struggle in, that you've stayed stuck in, then the second half of the message is going to tell you exactly how you can get out and make it to the other side. But the first half is going to tell you the mindset that you need to have. And so I think that this is going to be an easy message for application purposes, and I'm going to have some challenges along the way. So we're going to get into um, the thing that you're chasing after. We're going to read Romans chapter 8. It says, For to set the mind on the flesh... Okay, so this is our flesh, and what that means on the spiritual connotation is um, the carnality of man, so the sinfulness of man, our fallen state. When we set our mind on the flesh, it's death, but when we set our mind on the spirit, it is life and peace. So right out of the gates, he was saying this phrase, set your mind, right? And when you set your mind on the flesh, then it's death. And so oftentimes, I think that uh, people fall into the chasm of, I don't know. Well, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know the Bible. I don't know the Bible, Tim. Uh, we've never lived in an age 
that you can know the Bible easier than right now. I promise you, if you type in, because it says whenever you set the things on the mind of the Spirit, right, it says life and peace. So if you were feeling like you didn't have peace in your life, you can literally type in Bible verses, peace, and you would have 50 ways that you could get to peace. But you do have to put in some effort, right? And so surrendering to the abyss of I don't know is not acceptable if we want to move towards changing what we're chasing. And so it says here that there's a clear choice that when you set your mind on the flesh, it's death. It's death. And all of us in here, we know. We know this. There's been some times when you were focused on your flesh and what you wanted, what you wanted to say. Maybe it was in your anger or in your desire. And you know you have the scars to prove it whenever you set your mind on the flesh. And Paul echoes the same sentiment in Colossians chapter 3. He said, set your minds on the things above, not on the things of the earth. In both of his uh, letters that he wrote, he used this phrase, set your mind. And so I want us to start thinking about that as a concept of, of what it means to set our minds. Obviously, it's a choice. It's not like you have to uh, have your mind on something. It's, it's that you have to choose what you set your mind on. Uh, for instance, um, whenever we think about like the old timers in here, which now I'm in this crowd, right? Um, uh, there used to be uh, no digital clocks, right? And we didn't even have uh, phones that you could carry around. They were attached to a wall. And so um, back in the day, you had to uh, set a clock and how you set it was there was this key and you stuck it in the back of the clock and then you wound it and it made the sound like rah, 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 rah. and then it would like tick, 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 and it would go for a certain period of time and every day you'd have to wind the clock and then if you wanted to set the alarm you had to turn that dial and it would set to like say you want to get up at 8 a.m. you like you have to literally turn the little knob around to go to, and you can't just say, Alexa, 8 a.m. alarm set, you know. We didn't have that. We didn't have that ability. You had to use your little fingers and do something, okay? And so, so here's the thing. If in that era, raise your hands, by the way, if you ever set an alarm, like an actual alarm. Okay, see? I know who my crowd is. All right. For all you young people, I'm going to teach you something here. If you didn't set it, it wasn't set, right? Like, if you didn't set it and push the button in, was the alarm going to go off? No. And so here's what's crazy. Let's take that, apply it to our life. Paul is saying, set your mind. Set your mind. And so you have to choose. You have to literally choose where you're going to set your mind. And if you don't set it, guess what? It's not set. So if you don't set your mind whenever you wake up in the morning, I guarantee you, some of you on the way to church today, all right, if you didn't wake up and set your mind and say, okay, Today's going to be a good day. I can't wait to get down there. Can't wait. There's going to be people in the parking lot. They're going to wave me in, and then I'm going to get out, and they're going to be high-fiving me. I'm going to hug a couple people I know, and then I'm going to come in. There's going to be a worship song. I don't even know Jesus. Say, speak the name of Jesus. I don't even know that song. But, man, when you start saying, speak the name of Jesus, and your family and your friends, the next day around, they're like, yes, preach it. And I'm like, watching hands go up, and then you're ready for the sermon. Man, if you came in with your mindset on things above, I guarantee you your experience was totally different than someone who woke up and didn't set your mind. I'll guarantee you something already negative happened between when you woke up and when you got here if your mind wasn't set. See, your mind is not even neutral. In Romans chapter 12, I want us to look at how we set our minds. It says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by what? The renewing of your mind. All right, then you can test and prove what is that acceptable, perfect will of God, right? But I want you to get focused in on that renewing, okay? So whenever you think about your mind, it's not a neutral place. Your, your mind naturally wants to move toward the things of the flesh. The Bible says that we're all fallen, and as a result of our fallenness, that our hearts can become deceitful and it deceives us into wanting the things of this world, even though the things of this world can never give us the things of God. And so if you're not careful, you're chasing after something that can never satisfy you. And no one in here is ever chasing after something that didn't satisfy them, right? No one else 
No one else has ever gone down this road to perdition, right? And so as we're thinking about that, it's like your tires, right? If you ever get your car out of alignment, has anybody ever had that experience? If you have your car out of alignment, you're just driving down a road, a flat road, and you let go of the steering wheel, it will start pulling to one direction. And if obviously you didn't course correct, it will lead you into ditches and danger. And so whenever we think about our minds, Paul says that I have to renew it, right? I have to renew my mind in order for transformation to occur. We've been preaching about chance to change for five weeks now. This is week number six. And as we're thinking about that, you have to now get into this process of renewal. Everyone in here has subscription services, right? Everyone in here, you know, you, you have your subscription and you have your utility bill, you have your monthlies. And if you don't renew that subscription, if your little credit card payment doesn't go through, guess what? Guess what? When you pick up your phone, will it be on? No. When you go home, will your lights be on? No. When you go to log into your Netflix, no. They're going to make you renew it in order to get to experience it. And whenever we're thinking about our minds, Paul said you have to renew it. And if you don't renew it, then you won't know what to expect. You won't know what God's will is. He says when you renew it, then you'll be transformed and you'll be able to test and know what the will of God is. So how do we renew our minds? We have to think on the things of God. We have to think on the things above. We have to center, we have to set our mind and choose, I am going to focus on what God's will is for my life today. What does God's word say about it? When is the last time your will came into conflict with God's Word, and you allowed God's Word to win over your will. If you think about it, this is a simple litmus test. If you're renewing your mind on a regular basis, then some point you have to be like, oh man, I just really want to get mad at them because they did this. But then God says, love covers a multitude of sins, and now a wrestling match. You get in a fight with your spouse and you're like, oh, I'm just going to let them have it because I keep telling them and they don't listen to me. And then like 1 Corinthians 13 is like, oh, God bears no record of wrongs. And yet some of you are keep bringing up 94. Remember in 94? <laughs> Remember on our wedding day when you did <laughs> See, there's a wrestling match that is constantly occurring if you're trying to renew. But if you don't renew, if you don't even try, guess where you go? You go into dark places. I mean, you go into self-centered, selfish, self-destruction because you're thinking about you. The natural man is selfish. And so God says you have to choose to renew your mind. Every day, every day you have to renew it. You have to say, okay, God, what do you want? Is there anything? T try my heart, oh God. Find a new thing that's bad in me. Expose it. Because if you don't, you'll start looking down below. Now, anyone who's coached children in here, you understand this. Like, if you're ever trying to tell your, like, you ever seen a kid that just runs and they'll, like, look down and just wham. Has anybody ever seen this? Like, wham. I mean, just smash. Uh, when baby Jordan, our oldest, was, like, four, five, we were watching, I think, the show Lost back in the day, and um, we had some friends over, and he was in his room watching VeggieTales, probably, or something, or not his room, our room, but he liked to jump on our bed, you know, and um, all of a sudden there was a scream, you know, scream, you know, and you got, all parents, there's a hurt scream, and there's like a, we're fighting, you know, with sibling scream, totally different screams, and uh, this one was a hurt scream, and ah! You know, and he like came around the corner and had his hand on his ear. And when he moved his hand, you could see through his ear into his head because he had fallen off the bed and split his ear and cut it essentially in half. And that was our first uh, hurt moment. And I don't know if all you parents in here, if you haven't had that yet, your first trip to the emergency room. Carrie is not a panic person. She goes the other way. Ah! Damn, he's gonna die! You know what I'm like? Okay, babe. Okay, okay. Calm down. 
And so, like, on the way to the emergency room, I'm like, son, what were you doing? He goes, oh, dad, I was walking on the bed backwards, and then I was jumping, and then I slipped, and then I fell off. And I, I was like, what? <laughs> what? A, you start to wonder, right? Anyway. And I often thought, like, you know, from my adult perspective, I can see clearly, like, that was stupid, right? You're, you're like, well, well, that's what happens, right? And I often think, to flip it around on you for just a moment, that I think God looks at us like that. I think a lot of times we're just literally like, bam! He's like, what are we doing? What are we doing? Didn't we just go over that? Like, it's like one of the basics, like, right? Like, you know, hey, husband, wife are together. Like, do you know, this? it's a basic. Love each other, love people. You're not doing it. So I'm just trying to get you to see that naturally you won't do this. Naturally you won't do the right thing. You won't do the God thing. And you won't even go beyond the God thing. I mean, or not the God thing, beyond the, like, the good thing into like the extra mile stuff, right? Like whenever someone compels you to go a mile, you go two. Well, why, do I, why should I go two when I only have to go one? That's the mindset of the natural man. Do what you have to do. And yet Jesus didn't have to do anything. And yet he loved us enough to do everything, even give his life on a cross for our sins. Ergo, whenever you're thinking about your life and how you're setting your affections on the things above, are you, can you measure it out this morning and say, this is how I live for Jesus. This is the word that I'm applying to my life. This is how when I have conflict, I resolve it because I look up and I find what his word says and then I obey his word over my will. So that is how we renew our minds and that's how we become transformed. So if you start thinking about areas of your life that you would like to see change but have yet to see change, you might want to think, are your eyes above or are they below? Are they on the spirit, which brings life, or are they on the flesh, which brings death? And if you would like to quit experiencing death in a lot of areas of your life and frustrations and dead ends, then at some juncture, you're going to have to change the way you think. All right, fair enough. First half. And the church said, Amen. all right, let's move on to the second half. Let's get ready. Joshua chapter 3. Context. They have wandered around the wilderness for 40 years after they've experienced 400 years of slavery. Their faithful leader, because of his frustration in leading the people, um, Moses was not able to take them into the promised land. He has passed the baton to Joshua. And this is Joshua's first big test to cross the Jordan River. And the way that they're going to cross, it has never been crossed before. And so whenever you start thinking about that as the backdrop for what we're going to talk about in the second half of the message, there are some places that you've never been to before and the reason why you've never been to those places is because you've never gone the God way. And so today we're going to try to find the God way to the God places. And maybe that's going to unlock some levels in your life. Unlock some levels in your love that you've never experienced before because they've been shut off because you haven't renewed your mind. Is that fair? You guys ready? Okay, so they're up to the edge of the promised land. And God says to Joshua, go out, and this is what your people are going to tell the people. It says, then you will know, I'm sorry, when you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God and the Levitical priests carrying it, you are to move out from your positions and follow it. So God was challenging them to chase after his presence, right? And so he says, when you see the Ark in the Old Testament, God's presence, when they built this Ark, Wherever God's presence was, was where the ark was. And so the ark was like when it moved around, it literally blessed whoever possessed it, right? Whenever God's people wanted to go out to a battle, they literally carried this ark out and it represented God's presence was going with them. He said, so when you see the ark begin to move, then you need to move. Now, this is so simple. This is so simple. When God moves, you move, Right? When God, when he moves out, anyway, when you, when, when you see the presence of God moving, I have to ask you that question. Does it move you? Like when you're in a worship service and God's presence is moving, does it move you? When you read your Bible, does it move you? When you're praying, if you're praying and God's spirit is inside of you, God should be there, right? God should be there. 
And just a prayer, just the ability that you have at any given moment that you can talk to God, He makes Himself available, that should move you. And so I think a lot of times we've gotten so saturated in looking on the things above and focusing on our flesh instead of our faith that if we're not careful, we're no longer moved. And that's sad. That's really sad. God wants you to learn to expect amazing. We're going to get to that at the end of this message. But if we don't renew our minds, then we start to lose our expectation. And then we become kind of robotic, formalized Christians. And so God says, when you see me move, that you're going to have to follow after it. You can't become complacent and content with where you at, with where you are at. The, the sacrifice that you must put on the altar is comfort and what has become your pattern, right? Their pattern was to wander in this wilderness. And God is saying, I have something better for you over there. But you're going to have to surrender here in order to get there. And so many times, so many people, they just really love their right here, right? It's like, okay, Frisconian, Prosper, 380 Corridor, McKinney. Let's just talk about it, all right? Um, you know, you've, you've kind of made it to X far. Uh, I should say Salina too. Uh, sorry, Salina people. Um, so you've made it X far in your life. You've bought your house. Maybe you're settling down. Maybe you've arrived at the VP level and everything is, if you will, kind of comfortable. Maybe it's kind of convenient. Maybe it's kind of good. And now you're just going to work on that 401k and get to retirement age, you know, and then, you know, enjoy your life um, of retirement and leisure. And man, I could just see how you could be drawn into some malaise of not having Christianity that costs you anything. And God is oftentimes trying to push you into these places that are uncomfortable for you. And he brings you up to the edge and he's like, do you see me moving? Do you see what I'm doing? Don't you want to join in this process? And if you think about it, last weekend there was probably 70, 80 volunteers that made this winter weekend possible. And, and the natural mindset so the, the, the people that think below, they think to themselves whenever they think about serving God or giving to God, they think, I don't have, I don't have, uh, you, know, you know how busy I am? You know how busy I am? I mean, I mean, let's look at your, I want to get your phone out. And I want to see how much scroll time you have, okay? And then you tell me about you being busy. Anyway, okay, forget it. I'm just saying, like, Tim, you know how busy I am? You know, I mean, I got two rounds of golf in this week. But tell me, you want me to tell you how busy I am, right? And, and so, like, the mistake is, like, if you serve God, then it's going to take from you. This is such a wrong thought. If you talk to any of those ones who gave their time last week, made all that possible, and then you see the life change, I promise you the people that served got more than they gave. And it's, cra it's crazy. We say these wrong things in our mind that I don't have time, I don't have the money, I don't have the energy, the talent, whatever it is. But you're wrong. If you would give more, you would have more. And you say, well, that doesn't make any sense in the natural realm. You're right. But we're not thinking on the things below. We're thinking on the things above. When his presence moves, you must move. You must follow it. And then he unlocks things that are otherwise impossible. Let's go on. Verse 4. It says, then you will know which way to go. So when you see his presence moving and you follow it, he says, then you will know which way to go. This is, this is the sermon for someone in here. This morning, you have no idea which way to go. You have no idea. And how you're trying to figure it out is in the natural realm. You're trying to think like, okay, I'm going to take my list out. I'm going to make my pros and I'm going to make my cons. And then I'm going to do this. And then I'm like, I'm going to ask like a hundred people their opinion. And I got to go talk to mom and dad. And you know what? I, I'm not ever saying don't talk to your mom or dad, you know. But I'm just saying your mom and dad aren't the Bible. And the church said, amen. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Somebody better amen that hard. Like you've been trying to tell your wife that for ten years. Okay. And so... So he says, then you will know which way to go since you have never been this way before. He says, keep a distance. And I'm gonna, I, I didn't get it in the first service. I'm going to try. He says, about 2,000 cubits between you and the ark. Do not go near it. And that's so that 
people could see the presence of God at any moment as they crossed into this amazing space. And so I, I, I don't know if I have time for that, but I'll, I'm going to try, okay? So it says here that you are invited to the invisible, all right? The way to the place that you've never been is just below the surface, right? They're looking at the edge of a river. And they, uh, how, how? And God will bring you up to these barriers. And you're going to feel like this barrier is prohibitive. And Lord have mercy, I feel like we're raising what I call one barrier people, like one roadblock, and that means quit. Oh, like, oh, I tried and I didn't make it, so I, this must mean I just, I guess I'll never try again. Like, you know, I tried in love and I guess it just didn't work out. You know, like, hey, hey, sometimes God is bringing you to the barrier to teach you trust. Did you understand that? Like, it's trust. Like, he didn't bring you out here to kill you. And sometimes that's what you feel like. You're like, oh, God, I heard people like, I did everything that God wanted me to do. And it still didn't work out. Well, my goodness, did you think in this world it was going to work out? I mean, no. There's a lot of things in this world that don't work out. In the end, it doesn't work out too great for anyone in this world. You're going to die. Everybody say, you know that? Did you know that? Did you know that, like, some people are living like they're going to live forever, but you're going to die. All right? The next home is the one we're living for. If you are focused on the things above us and the things below, you quit trying to build a home like it's going to last. Anyway, I, got, I don't have time for that. So they see his presence move, and it says that you need to focus because you've never been this way before. You'll know which way to go because you've never been this way before. So, so oftentimes, we are trying to run the same play over and over and over again. Let me explain something to you. And everyone, you better say amen on this because this is empirically, verifiably true, okay? We are so good at seeing what someone else needs to change. Would you, go, would you guys agree? It's like you can see it so clearly. If you've ever talked to someone who's having marriage struggles, in the first five minutes, I will know exactly what the problem is. I will know exactly what the solution is. When my children come to me with a problem, within five minutes of talking, I will know exactly what the problem is. I will know exactly what the solution is. Do you know what the next five hours after that is? Trying to convince someone of what the right thing is. Does anybody say amen if I'm telling the truth? You trying to train an employee? And they're like, what do you want? What are you chasing after? I want to be number one in sales. Well, that's great. Like, but are you, are you, are you, did you call anyone this week? <laughs> did you research any leads? Like, exactly. I want to be the best manager I could ever be. Great. Great. Have you studied all the personality types and do you know how to motivate each one? Can you identify what they need from you as the leader? Like, Oh, well, I mean, but, you know, like, oh, no, I'm just going to lead out of who I No, no, you can only reach people like you. And there's not very many people like you. You're probably going to work with a lot more people not like you. So, like, hmm, oh, oh. So, like, we can see it so clearly in other people. I see marriages, it's like, they know, okay? If you don't pay the bills on time, it causes stress, right? We know this. And yet we don't pay the bills on time. We know when we bring up things of the past, it leads to this circle of abyss. We know that we have a difference of opinion on some other thing about how we should, you know what, you're being too harsh. Well, you're not being harsh enough. One time my wife would always say to me, she always say, she's right here by the way, she always say, I'm a very serious person. And she's like, you need to lighten up. And one day I finally told her, I was like, you need to tighten up. That's what, that's what you need to do. Like, but just want you to consider, I got some good ones. I like it. I felt like, I felt like that was a Carl Mueller laugh right there. It's like, oh, 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 oh. Oh, man. You can see it in so, so, other people so clearly. So let me ask you a question. Why, why is it that you think you can't see it in yourself. What is that? What, what is it that causes that? I would tell you that, that I think that most people can't be honest with themselves. That's what I believe. That's what I think I've personally experienced. 
This is the psychologist and the pastor in me having you lay down on the couch and examine you and asking you questions like, if you can't think of an area of your life that you're trying to change and trying to progress and trying to grow, it's because you sat down in something, right? If you fight about the same thing over and over and over again, it tells me that you're not working on it because it's not progressing. So here is God saying, the reason why you can't make it to the other side and the reason why you need to pay attention is because you've never been this way before. Is it possible that if you would set your mind on things above and you would renew your mind by allowing his word to rule over your will, that he could reveal a path that is just below the surface that would allow you to go a place that you've never been? And the reason why you haven't been able to get past the things that you can't get past is because you're not trusting in God. You're trying to do it on your own. There's a place. There was a path. It was just below the surface. But they were never going to discover it when their mind was below. It would break my heart if you were wasting your life going in circles when the path to the other side was right in front of you and you never found it because you wouldn't set your mind on things above. Joshua says, pay attention, pay attention. Tomorrow, we're going to do something and you need to follow God. And remember that God is the center of the show. That's the part I don't have time for today, but if you are living your Christianity in such a way that you get the, the praise and you get the credit and you want the praise and you want the credit, then you're doing it wrong. Like Joshua led the people across, but guess who was center stage? The presence of God. That's why God said, leave space. Not so that people can see you, so that people can see me. That's a whole other, don't have time for that. Last verse, and I'll wrap it up. Joshua told the people, consecrate yourself, for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. Here's the title of the sermon. You should expect amazing. You should expect amazing. Now I want to go through this process, and then this is my tool I'm going to give you for tomorrow, okay? He said, consecrate yourself. That means get ready. Get ready. Now I want you to think for a moment, how does one get ready for the water to part and us to walk across on dry ground? Like, what part am I going to play in that? Like if, if someone said, hey, get ready, we're getting ready to go out there for the game. I'd be thinking, all right, I gotta go, I gotta get my shoes on, I gotta get my clothes, I gotta go practice, I gotta get some shots, I gotta do some passes, I would do whatever, and I, I'm gonna physically do something, right? If we're gonna go dig a ditch tomorrow, I gotta go get my shovel, I gotta get my gloves, and like then all the people in here that are real men are like, I don't need no gloves, I got calluses on my hands, boy. And so anyway, um, it's like there would be something to do, but like what is there to do when God is getting ready to open up a river? Like you can't, you can't, you can't help with that. That's nothing that you can help with, right? That's something that he's going to do. So what is it that you're getting ready? Your mind. Your heart. You got to get your mind right and your heart ready. And it's going to twist the daub and say, Here's amazing. I got to get from below to above. I got to get from flesh to spirit. And when I dial that knob over and I say, tomorrow I'm going to expect amazing. I'm going to expect God to do something that I can't do to take me a place that I'll never reach on my own, to take my marriage to amazing, to take my kids to amazing, to take my profession to amazing, to take my church to amazing. God has put amazing in you. If you've accepted Christ, you have the Son of the living God as your Savior and His Holy Spirit as your guide. That is inside of each believer. We are now in Christ, and Christ is in us. He has put amazing in you. Guess what he expects? He expects amazing back. If you aren't expecting amazing, guess what? You are robbing yourself. You are robbing your family. And you're robbing your church. Man, 
Joshua said, tomorrow, when you get up, your heart's right. We're going to expect amazing. At Genesis Metro, every week, guess what? I expect amazing. On Wednesday nights when our few staff meets, we expect amazing. And you know what I found? God never disappoints. God is the only one who can get you to the other side. On a salvation level, you can't save yourself. On a marriage level, the two shall become one. The greatest dilemma of all time that we're both trying to share one space. Gosh. You think you can do that on your own? Raising children in today's age of every immoral thing within one click? Imagine how you would have done if you would have had that power to destroy your life in one post. You can't do that. You can't do that on your own. You need God. And God said, this is the way you do it. Set your eyes, set your mind on things above. Renew your mind on a perpetual basis. Plant yourself in a local church. Serve, live, give through a local New Testament church. And then amazing is going to happen. I bet for some of you that haven't experienced amazing in a while, do you think it's the seed or the soil? I would tell you that it's the soil. If you prepare your heart today, amazing will happen before this service is over. Whenever you get ready to worship in just a moment, God's going to move. And the question will be, are you going to move? Some people are what I call chair squeezers. <laughs> it's crazy how the physical demeanor of a person often represents the spiritual condition. And we'll have this worship song, and I'll watch people just grab that chair in front of them. And it's like so symbolic that I'm a, I'd rather hold on to what I have than let go and let God. And I'm not going to go out here and like try to watch and see, because I know some of you will be like, oh, he's watching. You know? No. <laughs> just listen. God's watching. God's watching. When he moves, you move. You're like, Tim, I'm not that kind of Yeah. You're not that kind of guy. None of us are that kind of guy naturally. I, don't, I, didn't, I wasn't raised in church. I didn't wake up singing Jesus, high-fiving God. That would have been weird. I looked at everybody that did that. I said, weird. <laughs> but when God changes my heart and I worship, I worship him freely, I promise you that's expressive. And there's no one in here that expresses love by doing nothing. When he moves, you move. Let's pray. Father, we ask in the name of Jesus, move us, God. Move us. Let us see your presence and let us join you in what you are doing. God, I pray for the families that need to make it to the other side. I pray for those that have been in the, the, the wandering years of making a circle over and over again but have never made it to the other side. That God, maybe today would be that breakthrough day where someone learns to trust you more than trusting themselves. God, I pray for every mind that is in here this morning that by your word and by your spirit, God, you would unlock their, their minds, that they would be able to look inside and see the things that are holding them back, to see the things that are causing them to stumble, to see the things that are causing strife in their lives, that are robbing them of the peace and the joy that you freely offer them. God, I pray that they would be willing to lay down those things that are holding them back and put them on the altar and say, God, I'd rather have what you want than what I want. And God, if we'd pray that today, I promise people would be set free. Would you guys stand and worship with us?